But these places will forever be linked by a series of crimes so shocking they are considered to be among the most brutal in the history of the Midwest. Some of these crime scenes were really truly horrific, even for uh, seasoned police officers. They were evil crimes, made even more frightening by the range of victims. Every woman in the Chicagoland area was at risk because it wouldn't matter who you were, what you looked like, it wouldn't make any difference. What your age was, what your race was, you were all at risk. At 11.20 a.m., law enforcement respond to a call about a bad smell at a motel 25 miles outside the city. The manager saw it probably had been a deer, maybe hit by a truck. There was a highway nearby. Instead, detectives find an unrecognizable body face down in the weeds. Her hands are bound behind her back with inexpensive nickel-plated handcuffs. Peter Siegman, the deputy coroner, and his boss arrive at the site to examine the body. The body was very, very badly decomposed. Um, you, you recognized right away that she'd been there for quite some time to be in the condition that she was. The victim has on a sweater, but no pants. Her underwear is down around her thighs. She has $17 tucked into her sock. Through dental records and fingerprints, the body is identified as 26-year-old Linda Sutton. The autopsy reveals that she was killed more recently than police initially thought. It turned out in the end that she'd been dead for about three days when she was actually found. Bugs take the easiest entry into a body, usually the mouth or other orifices. But this case was different. It was determined by the pathologist that the path of entry in this particular case was through uh, stab wounds uh, in the body, the upper torso. Her breasts, it turned out, had been removed. We would have no clue what removing a breast would mean. You don't think about people actually intentionally removing someone's breast. Catherine Ramsland, a professor of forensic psychology, is familiar with this kind of body mutilation. There are three reasons why someone might remove a body part. One is it's a paraphilia, which is a deviant sexual practice to somebody gets aroused by unusual objects or activities. The other can be symbolic in that they're removing a body part that's representative of female, for example, in order to then do something with it that will empower them. And the third one would be to as a memento or a souvenir from the murder. Detectives find bodies, that's what they do. But to find one in a field, handcuffed, with her breasts removed, and had been left lying there, um, you know, in this vacant field behind a motel, that's very unusual. Given that prostitutes tend to hide money in their socks, DuPage detectives think that Sutton may have been a city working girl. So they give Chicago PD a call. Detectives mentioned that they found this young woman uh, with the money in her sock, and the Chicago detective said, that does sound like one of ours. And the two men talked for a bit about, you know, where they had found the body, what condition it was in, or was there any other evidence? But there really was nothing at that time to connect this body that had been found out in the suburbs with a potentially a Chicago involvement in the case. Murders involving prostitutes are difficult to solve. Their dangerous lifestyle constantly puts them in harm's way. And when they disappear, few people notice. There was a significant investigation. They tried to determine everything about who this lady was, uh, where she could have been, who she may have met. Uh, you know, that investigation was ongoing, but it didn't turn up any, any solid leads at all. After multiple dead ends, the case goes cold. Shortly after 9 a.m., law enforcement in another Chicago suburb receive a call that 21-year-old Lorraine Borowski, also known as Lori, has been abducted in front of the real estate office where she works. The people got to the office and found it unusual that the door was still locked because uh, she was so dependable. 
And then one of the employees there noticed that there were keys and a few cosmetic items uh, lying on the ground in the parking lot outside of the real estate office and shoes. It looked like she was literally taken off the street. It's an aberration. These things just don't happen in Elmhurst. So we started to investigate that immediately. Lori's parents are notified. I couldn't comprehend her missing. I mean, Lori missing? Well, she'd expect us to go look for her. So we went straight to her apartment. And uh, there was nothing out of place. Her, her, everything was neat as a pen. We couldn't figure how she would be gone like that. You know, just all of a sudden she's gone. Lori's family desperately tries to find her passing out flyers and talking to everyone she knows. I don't think I slept after that. I, I don't think so, because when your child's missing, you're looking. I would carry a white sheet. I was going to cover her. Detective Commander John Milner is a certified investigative hypnotist. He often puts potential witnesses under in hope of extracting details they may have forgotten. He decides to hypnotize several people who were in the area at the time of Lori's disappearance. One recalls seeing an orange or red van at the mall parking lot. It was a lead. And it was something that we started to put out to other agencies. Uh, any potential abduction attempts with a red or orange van, uh, we did everything we could that didn't lead to anything at that time. Tips come streaming in, but they go nowhere. Elmhurst did a really wide and thorough, in-depth investigation. But finally, the case just began to dry up. The tips began to dry up. Lori simply had vanished. She was gone. Over the next four months, several other women are found dead in Chicago and the surrounding suburbs. In each instance, their valuables are left behind, but their bodies are violated in cruel and ritualistic ways. These were horrendous crime scenes. The women were hacked with axes. Several of them were beaten, their faces were beaten desperately, terribly. But in every case, every single one of them, their breasts had been slashed. And this was no sort of surgical type procedure. And in most of the cases, it was not post-mortem. Um, the women were still alive. If you see a lot of brutality that's anti-mortem, they want that person to suffer. They want to humiliate that victim before they actually kill them. So that's an added component to the fantasy. They want that person to understand psychologically that they're going to get battered and bludgeoned and hurt. There's going to be a lot of pain before they're murdered. This is a person who's usually angry, probably has been humiliated somewhere along their life. The women are found in the city's alleys, under bridges, and in the forest preserves that dot the outskirts of the city. But with robbery clearly not the goal, the motive remains a mystery. While all these various cases were happening, there was as yet no provable, followable connection between these various suburban crimes and the actual city of Chicago. After five months, Laurie Borowski's disappearance is still unsolved. It's months out, and we have this person who's gone, and uh, we're not getting anywhere. Her family holds on to hope. I thought she was alive. Somewhere. I thought somebody just took her. Close to a year and a half after Linda Sutton's mutilated body was found in a patch of weeds in Villa Park, investigators in DuPage County receive a call from Chicago PD. Could this be the break investigators have been waiting for? Or are the murders and mutilations in Chicago and its suburbs about to get even worse? It has been 16 months since Linda Sutton's body was found in Villa Park. 
Police have no leads. Until now. A Chicago prostitute is left for dead in an alley. Her vicious wounds are similar to those of Sutton's. She was in really very serious condition, uh, critical condition, when the police went to talk to her. She was not able to speak. Somehow, she musters the strength to communicate with police. Using signals and a piece of paper, she is able to give a detailed description of the man who attacked her. She explains that he handcuffed her and forced her to swallow some pills. And then her nightmare really began. He took what she described as a length of piano wire and wrapped it around one of her breasts and just kept pulling it, tightening the wire uh, until finally she passed out. And then the next thing she knew, uh, she woke up in the hospital. Forcing a victim to take drugs is one way to keep them from screaming, uh, also to keep them pliant and, and easy to control. So you can keep them stationary and perform something like using a piano wire to slice off a breast. He probably tried different things and looked at different possible weapons before he settled on the wire. And the wire, of course, if you hold it taut, is gonna slice through all kinds of things. And it's going to be a weapon that isn't going to be obvious should somebody come into his home to do a search, who's going to think a piano wire is what was used. She also provides detailed information about the vehicle he was driving. She described it as a red van, older. A red van was also seen at the site of Lori Borowski's disappearance. There were several very distinguishing features. Between the front driver's seats and the rear of the van, was a plywood partition. She also described a roach clip hanging from the front mirror in the van that had two long feathers hanging from it. One was blue and one was white. Immediately, police put out an all points bulletin on the van. Could it shed light on the whereabouts of Lori Borowski? They don't have to wait long to find out. Five days later, her body is discovered in a suburban cemetery. It is one of the hundreds of locations her family had searched in previous months. I was 10 feet from her body and didn't know it. I, I didn't know it. When her body had been found, we learned that her breast was m missing or mutilated. At that point, uh, the connection was made that uh, she was part of this uh, group of victims that were being mutilated in the Chicagoland area. With this perpetrator, there just didn't seem to be a clear type that he liked. So he, you could be a prostitute, a working woman, just a, a girl out to the movies, day or night, in the city, in the suburbs. You were a victim of opportunity. So these girls would have had no chance with him moving in. If he spotted you, it was over. Ten days later, a break. Back in Chicago, two detectives spot a bright red van with tinted windows driving down a city street. It was an older red van with a plywood partition between the front and the back and with a roach clip with a long blue feather and a long white feather hanging from the rear view mirror. And of course, just the first thought, I mean, that never happens. This doesn't happen. It's too good. It doesn't happen, but it happened. Officers stopped the van. The driver, 21-year-old Edward Spritzer, is visibly nervous. When he's questioned, he tells police that the van isn't his. It belongs to his boss. Robin Gett, a local carpenter and electrician. Could Gett be the monster they've been searching for? When Robin came outside, they saw he was exactly the description that they had been given. The van fit the description perfectly, and Robin Gett fit the description perfectly. They bring him in. Under questioning, he is even tempered and calm claiming he has no knowledge of the attack on the surviving prostitute two weeks prior, and that he was home that night with his wife. Police want to put him in a lineup, but the surviving victim is still in critical condition. 
so they bring Gek to her. She picks him out without hesitating. Well, she immediately pointed to Gek and, and was just <sighs> collapsed. She absolutely collapsed. She was just so uh, frightened, so terrified of him. Gecht is booked on several charges, including aggravated battery and deviant sexual assault. But he posts bond and promptly disappears. Days later, another prostitute comes forward and says Gecht attacked her, too. As Chicago PD issues a warrant for his arrest, they consider the idea he may have had an accomplice. They decide to have another look at his employee. Edward Spritzer. They were pretty sure that whatever Robin was involved in, somehow Eddie was involved in it too. He was just too um, frightened, almost beyond fear, jumpy, nervous as a rabbit. There was something wrong. He was in police parlance, he was dirty and they knew it. Law enforcement conduct a series of intense interviews with Spritzer. Gradually, they break him down. What he reveals is darker and more sinister than anyone could have imagined. Five women across Chicago and the surrounding suburbs have turned up dead and mutilated. Police finally have a suspect, Robin Gecht, a 28-year-old married father. They believe Gecht had an accomplice, so they pick up his employee, Eddie Spritzer, for questioning. When they started questioning Eddie Spritzer, he immediately opened up and the floodgates opened. Uh, he began talking about cases, giving details. Spritzer makes a shocking revelation to police. As part of a bizarre ritual, he and Gecht picked up the women, stabbed them, and then Gecht removed their breasts. As Eddie described it, Robin ripped that wound open himself. Robin then had sex with the wound on the woman's chest. I mean, how do you even process that? So the idea of removing the breast or wounding the breast or cutting an opening where the breast was so that he can have sexual contact, that's the paraphilia for Robin Gecht because he has said in letters to people that he comes from a long line of males who all had breast fetishes. He's developed through what we call orgasmic conditioning, that is, in eroticizing an object or an activity to the point where it, that's where he gets most of his sexual satisfaction. The breasts are used in special ceremonies. They would go up into Robin Gecht's little attic and they would kneel around the table and Robin would chant whatever chant he wanted to sort of ritualize the scene, to give it a semi-religious significance. They would then masturbate into this breast and then cut it into pieces and eat it. Spritzer confesses to the murder of seven women, including Lori Borowski. He also adds another player to the mix, a man called Andy. Basically, we were looking for a guy. Uh, some nutcase evil guy that was doing this and it turned out it wasn't one, maybe it was two, and then it was two, and then it was three. Officers pick up 19-year-old Andy Cocorales, who implicates himself in 18 murders, including those of Linda Sutton and Lori Borowski. He too tells detectives that he, Spritzer and Gecht, had intercourse with their stab wounds. It's a paraphilia for him, it has nothing to do with anything satanic or empowering. And he would make the others do it because for him, the act is one thing, but watching others do it is even greater because not only does he get to watch that, which is part of his fantasy life, but he gets to feel powerful over the other guys. Police discover that Gecht had a strong interest in Satanism and secret rituals. 
A former neighbor tells police that Gecht enjoyed reading books on torture practices of ancient cultures and that he was fascinated by how some ancients cut off the breasts of women and saved them for tobacco pouches. A girlfriend of Gex comes forward and states that he was always demanding that she cut off her own nipple, and if she didn't do it, someone else would. It's not just a breast fetish, it's a criminal, violent breast fetish where he wants that person to feel pain. To find out more about Andy Cocorales, investigators from DuPage decide to interview his brother Thomas. He quickly implicates himself describing how he, his brother, and Eddie Spritzer raped, tortured, and murdered Lori Borowski. They dragged her into the hotel room, and at that point, they threw her on the bed, they gagged her, they, they tied her down, and then uh, the two of the guys started beating her, and then they uh, started to have sex with her. At that point, they took out a three to four foot wire, and they placed it around her left breast. He was very specific to say left breast and they began to pull and squeeze the wire and they kept it in place until the breast was removed. And at that point, uh, they then had sex with the location on her body where the breast was. They took an ax uh, to uh, that uh, area after they had sex with it and uh, started chopping it. Then dumped her body in the cemetery. Tommy corroborates previous statements about the ceremonies. He explains that removing the breasts was Robin's idea and that Gecht has special powers. He had the charisma and the power to take these young men where he wanted them to go. They were absolutely terrified of Robin Gecht. Salos, solas, egos, marbas, salos, solas. The satanic stuff didn't salos, register with me. It's just like, what? I mean, tell me about this. Explain this to me. How did this happen? I think the satanic element is just plain bizarre. Um, when you find out how they were actually killed, it would take pretty much any normal human being and just stun them um, almost beyond belief. The group is dubbed the Chicago Ripper Crew by the media. Tommy Cocorales pled guilty to Lorraine Borowski's murder. He will be eligible for parole in 2017. Andy Kokorales was charged with multiple murders, including Laurie Borowski. He was executed in 1999. Eddie Spritzer pled guilty to four murders and one attempted murder. He was sentenced to death for killing Linda Sutton. Robin Gacht was never charged with murder, only attempted murder. He is eligible for parole in 2042 at the age of 89. He maintains his innocence to this day. You know, I, my, my entire police career, have never heard of such, uh, such a crime and, and cruelty to a human being that anyone could inflict. Uh, it was just, it was just, I, I, I can't describe it to you. It was... No one really knows how many women the Chicago Ripper crew killed for their special ceremonies. There could be fields out there somewhere with some woman's body in it that we will never know about. There simply was no way to, there was not even any way for them to remember all of the women that they had killed. So it, it absolutely is my belief that there are more victims out there.